Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Ask Julie Anything. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. A couple housekeeping items before I introduce our guest. Um, if you wouldn't mind, on the chat function, could you please change to all panelists and attendees so we can all join the conversation? And if you've got questions, we'll take them at the end of the session and probably the last 20 minutes, and we'll open up the mic and you can ask your questions one-on-one -on -one with our guest tonight, who is Dr. Chris Besant. Hi, Chris, thanks for joining us. Hey. And I just wanna say um, a big welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Chris is not only the founder of Herbsmith and the Simple Food Project, which I'll link in the chat. She's a DVM. She has a master's degree in Oriental Medicine. She's a certified veterinary chiropractic um, practitioner. She also practices acupuncture. Um, so we are in for a real treat tonight. Uh, tonight's topic is TCVM, Traditional Chinese Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Besant's gonna teach us about what it is, how it can help our animals. We might look at a couple of case studies and then we'll do Q&A. So what do you say without further ado? Chris, would you feel comfortable telling us a little bit about how you got started? What, what led you on this journey? And, and then we can roll right into it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am a veterinarian and in my veterinary practice, I was, I kept seeing patients that traditional medicine couldn't fix. So um, horses with really severe back pain in one specific spot that um, Western medicine didn't address and severe neck pain in animals that Western medicine was like, would just give them anti-inflammatories and hope it gets better and rest and hope they get better. And so I was introduced to veterinary chiropractic from Julie Kaufman. She's this amazing human chiropractor that kind of pioneered um, veterinary chiropractic. And she came and showed me some introduction to it in some of my patients. And I thought, wow, that's really something that I need to know. So I went and learned um, veterinary chiropractic. And then from there, there were all these wonderful veterinarians there that are like, oh, you should try stomach 36 and this herb and that herb. And I thought, mm, that sounds kind of magical. Um, but it sounded really neat. And then again, like, you know how the universe brings you things. And and a horse that I had been working on and I just couldn't get her back pain better. And an acupuncturist came out and needled her once and completely resolved the pain that I had been working on with this horse for almost three to, three to four months. And so that said to me, yeah, I need to learn that too. So then I went and took the best training available in the world for um, Chinese veterinary medicine. So um, acupuncture and then of course, once you learn acupuncture, acupuncture is always paired with herbs. And so then I thought, well, now I need to learn that. And so slowly but surely, I kept accumulating more and more tools in my toolbox so that every pet that came my way, I was able to help. Um, and I think that that was really my source of my journey is that it, I was frustrated with traditional medicine and that it, it it kind of was wait until something bad happened and then we can apply pharmaceuticals or we can do surgery. And that just didn't seem like a great approach to me. Um, and then after practicing uh, veterinary medicine for gosh, 25 some years, I thought I should go and learn the final animal, which was human acupuncture and herbs. And I wasn't so much interested in treating people. I was more interested in what could a human tell me that a pet couldn't? And so I learned human acupuncture and human herbs to be able to transpose it better onto animals and to be able to learn more about Chinese medicine and how it works with physiology and with a patient that could tell me exactly what was going on. So, so that's been really fun. And then I've been able to channel all of that knowledge into Herbsmith products, as well as into the Simple Food Project, where, as I was saying before, I don't think of a product as necessarily a product. I think of it as a herbal formula that, that has a solution to a pet's issue. 
So that's kind of where I got to where I am today. Amazing. Great. Yeah, it's always nice to hear everybody's story about how how they, you know, got to where they are. It's it's so it's always kind of similar, you know, where people just get to a point where conventional is not working for them yeah. anymore. And I don't know what happens. I, I think that, you know, either the universe slips something into, like you said, this, this horse for you. Yeah. Uh, and I, I just think that I tend to think that holistic practitioners are a little more tuned in to, and I don't mean that in a facetious way or anything, Yep. But it's almost like they're more open to an experience that can actually help guide them. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's so cool. I, I just love it. It's so, it's so heartfelt most yeah. of the time when you hear it, right? Yeah. And it wasn't, for me, it wasn't about, um, you know, I didn't grow up in a, in a family that was very holistically minded necessarily. It really, for me, was just a search to get more tools that I could help my patients so that every patient that came my way, I could help them. And what I found is those tools were more about being proactive than being reactive. And that really fit with my way of thinking. I personally am very sensitive to pharmaceuticals, personally. So that approach always seemed like I was, you know, using a mallet to, to fix something that I could have done so much more gently with herbs or with acupuncture or spinal manipulation. So it really kind of, um, it, it led me down this path. And then the really excellent part, and I'm sure Julie, you'll understand this a hundred percent is, you know, at first I had a few clients that were like, yeah, we don't like that stuff and we don't want to do it. And I thought, wow, I didn't go and learn you know, five extra years of knowledge to lose clients. But instead, what happened is the universe just flooded me with all these wonderful people and wonderful pets that, that felt the way I felt about it. So it, it's, been, it's been great. I've been practicing for 30 some years. And, and, and now I primarily run these businesses to, to hopefully partner with other veterinarians and other pet nutritionists and other proactive people like yourself to kind of extend it that little bit further. Well, I think I, I'm glad you said that because I, I, um, I decided to do this to promote other people. Right. And, and even though I have my own company, I, I always feel like, you know, we we have to form a community because yeah. There's, I always used to say, even at my vet hospital, there's enough sick animals and people to go around and, and people that are energetically, um, uh, drawn to you should be your patients or should be your clients, right? Because yeah. that people will just, you know, you'll, you'll get the people, you'll get the patients, you'll get the, the animals that need to see you. Yeah. And, and I feel like we have to form a community of like-minded people that have like for me it was is is I, I i i treated so many animals that then i felt like okay now i want to even have a bigger reach right yeah. Yeah. Where, where there's no way that they're going to get a holistic vet to see them they're just not gonna they're not gonna you know they're not gonna have and you know what's so kind of sad for me is that you know even today we have I mean, one of my team members just answers questions all day long. And the amount of people that still say, I can't find a holistic vet. It, it, it's mind blowing, you know, yep. it's mind blowing. So that's why I'm trying to have these two, right? To try and, you know, and, and, and just help people that can't find holistic vets or, or their, or their veterinary, their convention. What I always love is if, if we, if we hook up a conventional vet with a holistic vet, even if it's on the phone, right? Yeah. That's something that COVID actually did, which is, you know, again, if you want to want to try and keep looking at positive, positive things that come out of negative things, yeah. um, 
there's a lot more people that are chilled out about doing zooms and doing phone calls and doing things like that because we've had to yeah. so a lot of veterinarians i'm finding now conventional vets will be okay talking to like a holistic vet in a different um different province different country different uh state whatever yeah. So I yeah, that, I think that your feeling of abundance, like is it, it is contagious. So you're not a threat to a veterinarian's traditional business. You're a compliment. And I've always said that if, if people that came to me used all of our products throughout that pet's life, and then that dog needed surgery, they're so much better situated metabolically and health wise to be able to sustain the stress of the surgery that's needed. And that makes that veterinarian look really good. You know, that veterinarian can heal those animals really quickly versus one who isn't getting all of those wonderful things. So to me, it's also like an insurance policy, like let's keep your animal as healthy and vibrant their whole lives. And then if they need some of these other more drastic things, great but at least we've done our job in preparing them for that absolutely yeah their their recovery rates are faster they yeah i i've seen that a lot where where clinics will be wow you know they're they just breeze through it and they you know and even horses yeah. you know you know you do horses i have a lot of conventional that's where if, if if i've helped people like change diets and put and put horses on you know do fecals instead of routinely worming and and i've had conventional vets go wow you know this horse did this and i was expecting it to be laid up for this length of time and you know what did you know what's about what is this product about or, or something you know it's yeah. just it does it, it it is it's contagious but I remember kind of, talking. Kind of like you, when I first started, it was in the early 90s. So graduated from vet school in 88, which, wow, sounds really old now. <laughs> but I, I started practicing veterinary medicine then, but then started adding in holistic medicine in the early 90s. And at that point, it was kind of unheard of. Like I was the witch doctor. And the beauty is that other veterinarians saw how well those pets healed. So um, it got to the point that the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is about a two-hour drive from my, my practice, started sending all their oncology patients to me, or lots of them, because what they saw is those cancer patients did so much better when they were getting herbs and acupuncture, and I discussed food therapy with them. It didn't cure their cancer by any means, but it made their some it, occasionally it did but most of the time what it did is gave them a really great quality of life mm -hmm. and yeah. that made it really worth it and so the, the vet school didn't know what i was doing they didn't have a clue or understand it at all but what they did see was the results and and that's i i say don't judge me now judge me in two weeks or in a month when your pet is better than they've been in a long time yeah yeah, I I can relate to that too cuz on I I started in 97. Okay. And only in Canada and you know totally like flew in on a broom, right? Flew in on a broom with a <laughs> with a titer test. We didn't even have titer tests in Canada. Yeah. I didn't come to the US. Yeah. And it was it was and and I was um you know, I worked really closely with Guelph University, even though I was in Vancouver and Guelph was in Ontario, they with oncology too, same, same thing. It was, it was very interesting. And then it kind of went through a little bit of a thing where I think at the very beginning when nobody knew about it, I feel people were more open to it almost. Yeah. It almost like they were more open because we weren't a threat we were something different. It was something that they, if they were like, okay, hands up, I don't, I can't, there's nothing else I can do. Right. See this person or yeah, <laughs> sure. I'll talk to this person because yeah. there's nothing left to do. Yeah. And then it kind of went through a real bumpy stage where I think it maybe started looking a little more competitive. 
Mm. And then it got a bit, a bit dicey, right? But anyways, I think we're back around again now, I hope anyways. But yeah. it, I'm so excited to listen to you talk. I'm just going to shut up because <laughs> I'm very, very excited. And I promised my friend I was going to ask you a question for her because I, I told you she wanted to be on here so badly, but she's in an emergency. And um, I said, okay, okay, I'm not supposed to ask questions, but I'll ask you questions. <laughs> If we get around to it, I'll ask your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, when you ask about um, the traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, the best way that I think of it is um, it's very observational. So it's very much um, looking at what the pet is doing and what they're not doing and what time of day they're doing it and how weather affects them. And Generally speaking, we tend to to look at an animal almost like a little um, nature. So, and that in nature, you should have a balance of hot and cold, and you should have a balance of um, light and dark. And the same thing happens within our body as well. And a lot of what we see in the body, we also see out in the world. And so when I'm looking at a patient, I'm kind of looking at him with, with two perspectives. One is my Western veterinary perspective. Like, you know, the kidney is filtering the blood and producing urine and blah, blah, blah. But I'm also looking at it from a Chinese perspective and saying that the kidney, for example, is like the flame of life. And that as we age, that flame of life slowly but surely starts to dwindle. And we see that in older kitties, for example, who are chronically dehydrated. So that's what I really loved about it is it's a very different way of looking at things, a much more naturistic than scientific, much more observational. And so history and what the owner says is happening really matters to me. So when I'm listening to them say that they want to lay on the tile floor uh, or that little chihuahua who loves to snuggle under the covers or sleeps in front of the fireplace, all that is giving me vital information about what's going on within their body as well. Um, and then, so after you do kind of your history and your exam and you're looking at them from a um, a more of a naturistic perspective, then the exam from a TCM um, way of looking at things is a little differently. So sometimes it's just watching what they do. So when the border collie comes in and just lays down at your feet, you're like, ooh, that's not right. <laughs> you know, or the Aussie that comes in and just lays down at your feet instead of running all over the clinic. Um, so some is just watching, but then it's um, doing a pulse examination. And the pulse examination is done on the inside of the thighs of um, small animals, so on the femoral arteries, on the carotid arteries at the base of the neck in a horse, and in a human, it's done at, at your wrist. And there's 12 different positions that um, describe different meridians or organs and just describes how much yin is in the body or yang is in the body. Um, and then you look at the tongue and the tongue is like this mirror to what's going on within the body as well. So is it bright red? And so you know there's heat and inflammation going on in the body or is it really pale? And you know you have an anemia that we would see from a Western perspective but then we would also see, is there a lavender tint to it? And that lavender tint means that there's stagnation. So for me, I always kind of go back and say, in order to understand disease, you first have to understand and see health. And so health from a Chinese perspective is, is deeper in my way of thinking about things. It's not just that they're alive and they're eating. <laughs> it's, it's more than that. So are they um, have this equal balance of yin and yang. So yin is inward, maternal, fluid, nighttime, moisture, and yang is outward, aggressive, active movement, heat, 
daytime, summertime, and you need both and metabolism. And you need both. So you need to be to get up in the morning and enjoy your life. But you also need to, when the sun comes down, goes down, you need to be able to, that's at the yin time of the day, and you need to be able to relax and go to sleep and recharge. We need summertime where it's exciting and fun and we're picnicking and doing great things, going on lots of walks. And then the winter time when we're maybe reading more books and drinking hot tea. And that your body and a pet's body needs that balance as well. So everything for me is always, is there a balance of yin and of yang? And then the other component to health from a Chinese perspective is this equal movement of qi throughout your body. And qi, I've always just accepted it, so I guess it's never seemed like it was weird to me, but qi is your life force. Qi is, qi is the reason that if, if you, you and I as veterinarians were to suture a laceration, basically if there was a cut, we would sew the ends together, but that doesn't really heal it, right? That just puts them in approximation. It's still the cells that have to transfer across and make that knitting that happens to make it strong again. So chi is that knitting. Chi is, chi is the force that makes molecules either attract or repel. All of that is chi. And no matter how deep you think about chi, there's always an explanation for it. There's always that energy. So I like to think of chi as the energy of the body and the electricity, the light to the body. And that chi moves evenly throughout your body and throughout your pet's body. On, um, it's said to be on 12 different meridians, um, half on the right side, half on the left side that's mirroring. And it runs like down your arm to your fingertips or in a dog to the tip of their toes and then back up the leg and then might go to the face and then go back down the back. And so there's these well plotted out meridians that travel throughout the body. They also dive deep to the organ themselves. So if we talk about the liver meridian, the liver meridian comes up the inside of a dog's hind leg, comes up through the side of the body, but it also dives deep to the organ itself. <clears throat> so, I might, when I talk about liver, I might be talking about liver, the organ, but I also might be talking about liver, the meridian, this cable of electricity that moves throughout the body. Then each one of the acupuncture points are areas where chi converges. And so that where they're kind of like the light bulbs, if you look at like an electrical um, pathway coming into your home and that you have these light bulbs and each one of those light bulbs are like an acupuncture point and chi is the light that shines down into the room. And for complete health of pets and us, you need to have this kind of moderately bright room. You don't want it overly bright because that means there's too much chi, there's too much heat and inflammation, and you don't want it too dull because that would be that you don't have enough chi. So once you understand what health is, then you can take that same system of medicine and system of physiology and apply it to different um, issues that a dog might have. And what I found, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, is that the majority of the problems that we see in our pets today is of inflammation. And it's of inflammation for so many reasons, but I would say that a big part of it is we feed them this kind of dead, dry, hyper-processed food that just with low omega-3 content and just sets up this pro-inflammatory reaction in the body. And then from a Chinese perspective, that heat and inflammation could go to many different places. So it could go to the skin and then you would have skin allergies. It could go to the bladder and then you have crystals that are developing in the bladder. It could go 
to the brain and then you could have seizures. It could go to so many different places, but it's all kind of the same thing. It's all too much inflammation. And from a Western or from a Chinese perspective, we'd say it's too much yang, too much heat, too much inflammation in the body. So after this whole, and since we're talking about our journeys, after this, the deeper and the more I learned, the more simplistic it came, but it also came full circle. So I started out as a traditional veterinarian learning about, you know, heart arrhythmias and muscle function, blah, blah, blah. And then went on this journey of learning more of an observational, naturistic sort of medicine. And the amazing thing is we say the exact same thing. We just use different terms to to describe it. So I'll talk about excessive yawn and excessive heat. And really, it's too much inflammation. We talk about stagnation and that chi isn't moving. But what that really is, is pain and that kind of throbbing pain that you get with with stagnation. Mm -hmm. But Western medicine doesn't think stagnation. They think that you have this throbbing pain that is affecting your nerve roots, blah, 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 blah. What Chinese medicine says it's stagnation and we need to move those. We're kind of saying the same thing. We're just saying it in different ways. Yeah, I, I agree. But then I think what the big, I think we, I think we, there's a similar concept of what everyone's looking at, like you said. But I think that with like homeopathy or traditional Chinese medicine, our goal is to move it, right? And in conventional medicine, nobody's it's nobody's fault or it's not in it's not a judgment, but the majority of it is suppressing it. Yeah, yeah, very true. Like like instead of going, okay, let's move this, let's get the chi or the vital force or whatever back in homeostasis or back in balance or let's get the flow happening. Um, it, it's more like we need to stop this, yeah. stop the inflammation, stop like in it, in, in that, in my personal opinion has been, I think not, not that there's a lot of difference, but the treatments are different. The treatments, the conventional approach. treatment approaches are very suppressive yeah. and a holistic is more fluid movement, right? Yeah. And I would also say that I would add to that and say they would, uh, Western medicine, we want to suppress that itch. We want to stop the inflammation and then hope that the body gets better on its own, that the innate intelligence of the body gets better on its own. And if it doesn't, then it's going to keep on reoccurring and reoccurring and reoccurring. So um, allergies is a great example. Chinese medicine and Western medicine both agree that it's this hypersensitivity. Chinese medicine would say is this excessive yawn and excessive heat. And if you could bring that down, you could change the way that the body responds to the allergens. Western medicine says because of their approach and suppressing the symptom, it is it's dogma, right? That it's just going to keep on getting worse. That first they're going to be allergic to 10 things and then it's going to be 20 things and then it's a hundred things. And it just keeps on going. Yeah. Chinese medicine, it's the opposite. It's yeah. as you're bringing down that heat and the inflammation and that hypersensitive immune system, you're kind of turning it back so that because it's not about the allergen, it's about the way the body responds to it. And just as you said, Western medicine is suppressing that response, where Chinese medicine is saying that response is because of X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to use acupuncture. So I'm going to place needles in, in different acupuncture points. I'm going to use Chinese herbs. I'm going to use food therapy to try to change that and do things that I can do that are kind of pushing the body in the right direction. And I don't care what the allergen is, quite honestly, because it doesn't matter what the allergen is. It matters what the body, how the body responds to that allergen. Yeah. So the beauty, and and here's from a positive note as well, is we're so fortunate that we can have teams of people for our pets. And I don't think that a holistic vet should be like, 
the last resort or the only team, the only member of your team. When we need pharmaceuticals, when we need surgery, thank God that we have it. Absolutely. But you and I work in this air, like if this is the, a pyramid of health and this is the foundation, that's where we tend to work, where yes. surgery and, and pharmaceuticals are just at the pinnacle, but don't address anything down here and just hope that the innate intelligence will make it better. And I think there's so many wonderful, proactive things that pet parents can do. And that's really kind of led me down this journey of expanding and that expanding that thought process of empowering pet owners to know better, to do more, to be able to kind of approach it more proactively than just reactively. And I think the reason that that we're all so successful as holistic practitioners is because the world understands that and the average person sees it and, and they don't care what makes their pet better. They just want their pet better. And the fact that this keeps their pet better is, is substantial to me. Yeah. It's, I think that I think I, I love real integrative medicine right? Like it's, it's, it's amazing. And I think that, um, you know, we, at my, my last practice, we had everything, we had ultrasounds and surgery and the whole nine yards, but we were, the, the, the difference was, is, and we had really good surgeons and, but our primary modality was holistic medicine. Yeah. And if we needed to reach for the it was like the conventional was our add-on yeah but then rather than the opposite right and i think gosh. yeah it was it was great it was it was a really really good good way to approach it you yeah. know yeah I, think uh, so. uh, I i i just find chinese medicine i mean i find all holistic medicine like just so mind-blowing and and I love it because I feel like there's always something to learn. Yeah. Like no oh, matter what, yeah. like I'll be like 120 and I'll still be like, wow, really? <laughs> um, yeah. and, and I had such a wonderful experience with, with a, um, a TCM, a traditional Chinese medicine doctor, uh, not a veterinarian, but he was from China. And when I first, first started my clinic, because I couldn't find a veterinarian to do acupuncture. Yeah. So I found this man through a veterinarian and um, he in China, he was a, a human doctor, but they were taught how to treat animals in, in, in human medicine. He was about, he was an older gentleman um, and just watching him, I was just, he, he could hardly speak English, but he didn't have to. He just right. would just like, look at, look at them and start writing all of this stuff down and where things were blocked and oh it was so fascinating i just i just loved it i totally loved it i agree so, it's like a it's like a logical puzzle it and, is and then if you it, whatever you apply whether it's the acupuncture and the herbs or the food therapy then how they respond gives you even more hints as to what's going on internally and mm -hmm. it it has been fascinating. I, I can say that I would find it very difficult to practice um, veterinary medicine without it, without that way of thinking of things. Um, and the fun part is, I'm sure you appreciate this as well, is many of my clients also thought that way. You know, like it, it got to the point that when people would come in, they would say, you know, she he's laying on the tile floor again, or he's you know, seems agitated at two in the morning again, and just learning more and looking at more of the fine details, or the arthritis always gets worse when it's cold and damp. And, you know, I think that arthritis and um, joint pain is one of those TCM things that is um, really, we look at pain from a um, Chinese medicine perspective, similar to Western medicine, 
but not 100%. So Western medicine, you have pain. And so you want to inhibit the inflammatory response. And we're going to give you really big drugs that are going to inhibit that inflammatory response. And for some of that, absolutely works. So from a Chinese perspective, we would say there's stagnation there. But that dog has vibrant, healthy qi and there's stagnation. And those dogs do great with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So whether you use acupuncture and herbs or whether they can, they can tolerate the negative side effects of the pharmaceuticals, those dogs do well. But the dog that doesn't do well is that older pet. That older pet that their level of chi is decreasing. And so they have stagnation, but they have stagnation because the, if you think of chi as a river, the water of a river, that it's stagnated because there's not enough water in the river. So when you give that dog a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, they don't get much better. And, you know, what does Western medicine think about it? Eh, that owner doesn't know. No, it's because that it not, if you only have a hammer, then that's the only tool you've got. And so you can't imagine there could be another tool that could fix that. Chinese medicine would say that older pet, we need to raise their level of chi so that then we can start to move it. So the herbs that you would use and the acupuncture you would use with that patient would be different than, so if I was looking at an older golden retriever who gets worse when it's cold, it has arthritis, arthritis pain, that gets worse when it's cold and damp. And then I have a young Vizsla who smashed into the wall chasing the ball. Now that dog has the strong chi that I can just, give it a pharmaceutical or we could give it herbs and, and that's going to get things to move again. But that older pet, that's a whole different deal. And we got to slowly, but surely build them up. And then when we build them up, then it can start to move again. And it's a concept in Western medicine that they, that you don't really see. No. Another concept in Western medicine that I think is different than Chinese medicine is yin. And yin is that moisture, it's the, um, you know, nighttime, cold, maternal um, moisture, fluid of the body. Western medicine, we, we're like, you're dehydrated or you're not dehydrated. That's it. And so we either need to give you fluids or not give you fluids. And we talk about, you know, lymph that might be stagnated in certain areas, that sort of thing, but we really don't talk about yin deficiency and how yin deficiency, if you've got this balance, you know, that Tai Chi symbol of yin and yang, and yin should always be balancing yang. And it's this constant push and pull between the two, and it should be. And, but if you're yin depleted, so you don't have enough fluid and moisture in your body, like kitties, uh, older kitties, for example, then yawn is relatively speaking out of control. And so um, some cases of hyperthyroidism in kitties is because really not be necessarily because of yawn in excess, it's really of yin and deficiency, and it's that imbalance of the two. So that's the really interesting part of, of looking at a patient from a traditional Chinese veterinary medical perspective versus a Western medical perspective. And then when you do about it, it's different. So then we would pick needles, acupuncture, and that acupuncture would be, it could be one needle, or it's usually 10 to 12 different needles that are strategically worked together. So turning on the light bulbs or turning down the light bulbs um, throughout that pet's body. And then almost always those pets would go home with some herbal combination that, that I would have for them. And the herbs are a gentle everyday persuasion in the right direction. And then we always talk about food as well. And that food is definitely going to affect your body. So food energetics is huge. Um, and the best way for, that I think of food energetics is 
what do you eat in the summertime versus in the winter? So in the winter, you're going to choose to eat root vegetables and stews and soups. And in the summertime, you're going to eat fruit and salads and cool foods because externally the ambient temperature is too hot or too cold. And we want to use food to change, to kind of balance our body out. It's our innate intelligence. It's just, it's just obvious that that's what we'd want to do. Well, the same thing holds truth for our pets as well. And I think once you ex explain it in that light, most pet parents immediately understand that. And what I love about food energetics is it's such a easy, simple way that a pet owner can be proactive in their pet's life by what they're going to do every single day. But let's just select the right stuff. So certainly species appropriate first, absolutely. Number one, low carbohydrates, you know, organic if you can afford to do it. Absolutely all of those things first. But then take food energetics and that's going to be one more slant that you would do. So for example, um, in allergies, lamb is one of the hottest meats. And for years, what did we give allergy dogs? We gave them lamb and rice diets. And in the beginning, so in the, gosh, <laughs> 70s and 80s, I was say lamb, 80s. Was a, lamb was a novel protein. Yeah. It really wasn't in a lot of pet foods. So those allergy dogs did do okay with it. Well, now lamb is, you know, in the top three of the most common meats that you're going to see in commercial pet food. So now instead of being a novel protein, now it goes back to its true food energetics. And what I found in my veterinary practice is if I just stop that allergic dog from eating a lamb and rice diet, boom, it was like, Every day they fed that dog, they added kerosene to their fire. They added heat and inflammation because lamb is a hot, a hot meat. And yeah. so every day they added kerosene to this dog's fire. And if you just took them off of that and put them on cooling meats, I just kind of put the tide in your favor. And it, it's pretty, you know, it's really gentle, but can be very dramatic at times. Can you tell people what cooling meats would be? Yeah, um, the best cooling meats are um, fish and rabbit and duck. Those are the, your best choices. Unfortunately, if you think about it, a lot kind of in that light of um, salads in the summertime, lots of vegetables are cooling. And that makes a lot of sense that those are very cooling. So there's not as many cooling meats. Most meats are neutral to slightly warming. Okay. So chicken and turkey are um, slightly warming. Um, beef and bison, the red meats, those and pork are neutral. So neutral means that it's not going to positive or negatively affect the thermoenergetics of the body because it's really about how that pet feels when they eat it. Kind of how we feel when we have that stew on a cold night and that we just feel better. And the same thing goes for the, for a pet. Right. Okay. So right. Um, at Herbsmith, at herbsmithinc.com, we have free food energetic charts that you can go to and you can download and you can use them and you can evaluate the food that you're doing. You could evaluate um, a commercial food and say, if the first five ingredients on that ingredient deck were cooling, great, then it's most likely a cooling food because it's really the whole energetics and one doesn't necessarily eliminate the other. Um, so you could look at a commercial diet and decide if it's warming, cooling, or neutral. And the best way for you to use those food energetic charts is just really watch your dog. Where do they want to sleep? Do they sleep in the sunshine? Do they sleep in front of the fireplace? That dog's too cold and needs warming. Are they older? Older pets almost always, the kidney is the flame of life. And so your flame gets lower and lower. That's why people that are older tend to be more cold as their flame of life is decreasing. So older pets are almost always gonna do better on warming foods. Um, 
that kind of helps you decide what is my dog? Is he too hot? Is he too cold? Or if he's just vibrant and healthy, then go with kind of that idea of guts of steel and rotate it. You know, like I would get three different formulas. I'd put it in my freezer or my cupboard and I just grabbed it. And I didn't even pay attention to which one I was doing because they're scavengers. They're going to eat whatever they come upon. They're not going to go, oh, I only eat a rabbit. <laughs> and so a good, healthy dog, you would want to mix it up all the time. I'm really happy that you talked about the older dog because, or cat or horse or anything. Cause I, I, I remember so many times people coming in and feeling like it was too late, you oh, know? Yeah. yeah. And, and an old, or an old dog coming in with an injury or an old cat with an injury or, or even an acute, you know, of, of some kind yeah. and, and you, you treat them and they'll come back and say, oh my gosh, this is like, not only is he better, but he's like three, it seems like three or four years younger. Yeah. Like he brings so much, so much better. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool to watch animals that have bit, that are slowly depleting and then you get them on the right food and the right, you know, uh, supplements and herbs and homeopathy and everything. And they just, they, they can just brighten right up. It's, it's, it's quite, it's quite amazing. I agree. I, it, it, and it's kind of, you know, you fight it every step of the way and older pets just need more attention. So one of the things about older pets is that as you age, your natural endogenous production of antioxidants. So that starts to go down. So you have antioxidants in your body come from either what you eat or what your body makes. And as you age, your own anti endogenous, the production within your body goes down, the same thing for pets. So you need to feed more antioxidants or you and I, or I, <laughs> need I, to yeah. eat more. <laughs> I need to eat more antioxidants yeah, and for sure. eating more blueberries. If, if I'm not producing it myself, I need to add it to my diet. And yeah. sometimes just adding fresh, fresh um, antioxidant vegetables like broccoli and spinach or adding um, blueberries or raspberries into a dog's diet will clear their eyes and mm -hmm. get rid of that kind of dark, foggy, um, old dog eyes. And mm -hmm. it's because those antioxidants are decreasing the oxidative stress in the eye. And again, what an amazing thing that nutrition can do so gently, so easily, and can make a huge, profound difference on your pet's life. And I think, I mean, cats are, even though cats are, are, are definitely more carnivores, someone had a question real fast that I saw. What about cats? Can you give cats antioxidants and stuff? It's like, yeah, of course you can give cats you definitely can, and, but I would say that cats um, need more omega-3 fatty acids. Um, they use that as an anti-inflammatory um, a, a lot more than a dog. So um, dogs are really great at producing vitamin C themselves. When they get sick, they can upregulate the production of vitamin C, where cats really don't do that. Um, but you can be increasing their omega-3s in their diet. And then what I say for kitties is if, because you can feed such a small amount of vegetable matter, non-animal matter, make every, every bite count. So those are the animals that really need the superfoods. You know, those are the ones that should get a, a blueberry or a blueberry extract or something like that, where you can really concentrate the antioxidant potential. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like cats, cats, I think need more palatable, maybe herbal supplementation. Like, like you said, with a, with a, a, a small tincture or phytoplankton, my cats love phytoplankton and it's yeah, got perfect. lots of superoxide dismutase in it for perfect. any, like, 
you can't just give them broccoli. And <laughs> my cats would be like, what? <laughs> no, <Nobody laughs> was that. it under my pillow. Um, uh, yeah, no, that would not go over. <laughs> uh, because I think, you know, if, the, if we're looking, like, like you said at the beginning, it's species, right? Yeah. Like if we, if we are looking at, you know, cats going out and eating chipmunks and birds and, and rodents, they're eating the antioxidants through their gut of their prey, right? So we're, yeah, we're, we're removing yep. that from them. But yep. Stephanie, can you start asking questions? And, and when you do, I'm going to, I am going to ask this for my friend because I feel so bad. <laughs> and it was for horses and barn cats. Um, she said, what do you recommend as far as uh, par for parasites? Do you routinely worm them with um, conventional drugs or do you, what, what do you recommend for parasites? Um, personally, I do use more conventional drugs. Um, I do use um, normal deworming antiparasitic but then I would take it a step farther and say, why did that parasite cohabitate in the GI tract of that pet? And I would say it's opportunistic because it could. And so I would deworm them, but then I would take it a step further. So then I would say, what are you doing for the, butt, uh, for the gut biome? What are you doing to increase their immune system? What are you doing to, um, for a horse management wise of, you know, removing the manure from, are they in a heavily manure laden area that they're eating grass around it? You know, just kind of basic management things. But I would say, and, and this is where Chinese medicine would come in is, is that parasite there because it's a really bad parasite or is that parasite there because it's opportunistic that it set up shop because it can. So I do think that I would use more, I wouldn't use the, I would use the very safe dewormers like um, pyrantal, strongid, those sorts of things. But then I would take it the step further and say, what am I not doing right that's supporting the gut biome? What am I not doing right um, to keep their immune system as good as possible? Or yeah. is it, I'm, am I in the process of making them healthier? Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I would agree with that too. Is why you know, are they the part about Chinese medicine is if you used, if you use Chinese herbs to deworm and you can, then you start getting close to the toxic level of those herbs and that's just not how I think of things. Like I, 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 I think that I like the synergistic effect of herbs and all the biochemicals within the herbs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that then it becomes, the beauty of herbs is that it, they're made up of thousands of small active ingredients that all work better together then each individual one does work yep, for separately. sure for sure and so part of that is having it at a, a dose or an amount that would still be in that synergistic rather than getting into that toxic range and i think you also like for me because i'm such a microbiome person i think looking at that like 100 percent looking at that and if you have situation where there's there you have an overload of parasites is you know i like strongid too i think it's probably one of the most inert ones um but you know doing it but then supporting the microbiome at the same time and detoxing at the same time and then like you said getting in so that it, it doesn't reoccur like yeah. like being proactive so that you don't have a a reoccurrence of it and it's i always recommend doing a fecal and not just routinely 100 percent yeah absolutely thank you uh, oh sorry okay. Julie. Can you, no can you start asking yeah uh debbie's <laughs> got one here dr percent forgive me if this isn't related to tonight's topic can you explain external wind oh yeah um it, it, wind is kind of um in that 
in that looking at the body as a um, as a small nature, as a micro, as a as a as a naturistic biome almost that is integral to our ambient world, but also um, has some of the same principles within the body. So wind in, in regular everyday kind of weather, wind happens when cold and hot comes together. So if it's hot out and a cold front comes in, you always know that cold front is coming in because it starts to get really windy. So the same thing happens in pets and in, in people in a, in, in a physical physiology body. So if, for example, you have a dog that is colder and then they get a rabies shot and a rabies shot that is, has a really strong adjuvant. So the liquid that's in it causes a really strong immune response, that's heat. So you have cool and now you have a front of hot coming in and then you get wind. And so what we see clinically is we see allergies. So now that dog starts itching and that's wind on the surface of the body. And so what I would say is I would use herbs to bring down that heat and I would use herbs to bring down the wind as well because I want the itching to stop and so that they feel better. But my primary way of treating them would be use herbs that decrease the inflammation that happened by that injection of a rabies vaccine and the adjuvant that came with it. Now let's take that, that's kind of external wind, that's where you're getting um, itchiness to the skin, those sort of hives, that sort of stuff. But if wind gets deeper into the body, then it's seen like a tornado within the body. And this tornado within the body is often seen as seizures. And seizures could be, you know, idiopathic epilepsy. It could be petite mal seizures where they just chomp, 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 or they have some twitching. Or those old dogs that have like um, twitching of their hind legs. That's all internal wind. And internal wind is when that hot and cold come together again. And almost always, that internal wind is um, associated with liver stagnation and that liver stagnation always produces heat within the body. So, so I would use in that particular case, I would use herbs that bring down or raise the seizure threshold, but it brings down that liver chi stagnation and that liver heat and that liver wind. So it's really a great question. But that's kind of TCM 2.0. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Besson, is it okay if we go just a little bit over with a couple more questions? I'm, I'm great. I'm, awesome. I love talking. So you are the best. <laughs> Anything I can help you with. <laughs> All right, Becky, I'm going to give you the mic here. You should be able to talk now. I see you're muted. There you go. Hi, Becky. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Becky. Cool. Hi, Dr. Bissett. You um, have been fantastic so far. I have learned so much already just listening to you. Um, yeah. I work for a rescue. We have a really sick dog uh, within the last week that developed um, a protein-losing nephropathy. Uh, they now realize after misdiagnosis of a UTI a month ago is bacterial endocarditis. Um, the dog uh, within one month, went from pretty much normal kidney values and normal phosphate, normal calcium, into probably a grade three kidney failure wow. uh, within the last four weeks. It's a five-year-old dog, um, and we just really got the diagnosis uh, a couple days ago. My question for you was about a Chinese herb that somebody had recommended called Raymania. Uh, Raymania 8, does that ring a bell? And yep. is that something that could help this dog? Uh, we're, we actually do have a, an appointment with a holistic vet on Saturday. She only works in our area two days a week. Uh, but listening to you, is, if you were in California, 
you would be where I would be. Um, <laughs> we were just wondering uh, if there was something we could do to help this dog's kidneys while it's on these two antibiotics for God knows how long. A hundred percent. So that formula is called Jirba Dihuangsan. And it's a really amazing Chinese herbal formula that is, um, it's all about nourishing the kidney and um, kind of decreasing the inflammation in the kidney. But it has two herbs in that formula that are really great for bringing down heat. And in Chinese medicine, there's two kinds of kidney failures. There's the kidney failure like this pet, where they usually have um, high blood pressure, they usually have a real inflammatory um, internal landscape, essentially, um, but they have too much heat and they have too much yawn. And so you need to bring down that heat, but you also need to nourish the yin. And so that formula is hands down the formula to use. And I have used that formula for years and it works great in pets. Um, I would say that I would do acupuncture as well because the acupuncture is kind of like a big jolt in the right direction. And then the herbs are gonna be everyday persuasion to get them back into the right shape again. And I've literally had dogs in my veterinary practice with um, that exact issue that lived out their entire lives. So they wow. came to me at four and five years of age. They stayed on those herbs their whole life. <laughs> By 16 and 17, the owner, one of them just makes me giggle because one of the owners was like, do you think we still need to give them the herbs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After she so said funny. it, she's like, yeah, that sounds bad. <laughs> because... He, you know, he had like, like your dog that you're talking about. They're like, we got months and that's it. And, and there is nothing we can do. And Chinese medicine, that dog lived his entire life and lived fabulously. So I'm not saying all dogs are that way, but I am saying that that condition is considered false heat of the kidney and false heat of kidney chi and your um, holistic practitioner that you're gonna go to, she's gonna know all about it and she's gonna be able to acupuncture and she's gonna use the right herbs and hopefully she'll talk to you about um, food energetics as well, but absolutely you're on the right track. Yeah, and we, we're, the food energetics is something we are definitely working on with this dog. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in food and, and good, healthy, organic food. And the owner now is too, but we needed something to kind of dog quickly. And uh, I appreciate all of your, uh, your, your great information today and this. The one thing that I would say about food energetics in him is you're going to be inclined to want to just use cooling foods. Um, but you don't want to just use cooling foods in him because he's too hot and he has this um, high blood pressure going to the kind of bombarding the kidneys, but the kidneys themselves are um, uh, 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 element that gets worse when it's cold and damp. So uh. you still need to use yin tonifying herbs and there's a diff or in tonifying um, Foods. foods because there's uh -huh. a difference between bringing down heat and raising up yin and like that formula that you talked about the root of that formula is about raising up yin and increasing okay. moisture to the body and then there's two herbs that bring down heat and you want to do that same thing with the food and it's a, it's a subtle difference between cooling foods and yin tonifying foods because they're both kind of getting to the same spot, but they're coming at it from different directions. So you want to do both with the foods as well as, and you can go to Herb Smith Inc. And we have all, all free food energetics charts. And we talk about um, the yin tonifying foods, list them out for you versus the cooling foods. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're Greatly welcome. I'm glad you're here tonight. Thanks. That was awesome. I'll post your uh, website right now in the chat for everyone. Um, the next question here is for Bev. Bev, I'm going to give you the mic right now. You should have talking permitted. I see you're muted there. Oops. Yeah, there you go. I'm here. Hi, Bev. Hi. 
Can you hear me? I have, hi. I have a five and a half year old English Springer Spaniel. She's spayed 35 pounds. Her thyroid is very low normal. And what would you suggest for that? Tell me more about her. Is she um, in good weight? Very good weight, uh, excellent body condition. The, the vets have always commented on how good her body condition is. And her, her hair coat is good? Her coat um, is coarser than my other Springer's, uh, and she is losing hair. She's very itchy. Okay. Um, she has had um, some... a little chunky? Pardon? Is she a little chunky or is she, I, it, you said she's in good weight. Is she a, um, a dog that you can feed, you feed less to keep her in good weight? Actually, no, I'm actually at this, which is, which is kind of strange for low thyroid. I understand it's, she has, um, I actually feed her more to gain weight. Okay. And is she cool to the touch? Not usually. And where does she not like, that I've noticed. Where does she like to sleep? She sleeps on the foot of our bed, sometimes in her crate, but mostly on the foot of the bed. Okay, on the, on the ground. No, no, on the bed itself. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and will she stay there all night? Oh, yes. Okay. Always has. And do you know her, um, the, her mom, the bitch? I've met her, but I don't know her well. And did she have many puppies, many litters of puppies? I don't know for sure, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that possibly. That she possibly has. Okay. Yeah. Um, from a Chinese perspective, I would say that hypothyroidism can be two things. It can be um, decreased qi or it can be decreased blood. And... Decreased chi is, and I'm just going to talk and then you tell me what kind of fits for her. And then I'll tell you what I'm thinking may be happening. Um, it's either not enough chi or not enough blood. And not enough chi is going to be kind of that dog that's cold, that dog that seeks out warm places. Um, they tend to have a low metabolism, so they tend to get fatter. Um, not high energy. They're just kind of hanging around and he has a ton um, of energy. He has, she has a lot of energy. Oh yeah. Okay, good. So the other is a deficiency of blood and deficiency of blood is oftentimes being the, the child, being the puppy of a bitch that has had a lot of puppies and that, um, we don't really acknowledge the amount of chi and blood that a mom gives to her children. And so uh, a bitch gives to her puppies. That it takes a while for her body to regenerate again and to get back to the level of chi and blood that she had before she had that litter of puppies. So if she was, you know, uh, the kind of dog that they just kept on breeding her. And so then eventually what happens is by the third or the fourth litter, she doesn't have a lot to give anymore. And so those puppies don't have as much chi and they don't have as much blood as they, as they should have gotten if they were like the first litter. And so it sounds like that might be what's going on with her because those dogs also have, they lose hair and they also have kind of a, a dry itch to their coat um, but they're not screaming the other way. Like they're not just laying around. They're not just couch potatoes. And so the herbs that I would use would be more blood tonifying herbs. I would use lots of omega-3 fatty acids because omega-3 fatty acids are going to just nourish the body overall, but really nourish blood as well. Um, I, and then for food energetics, I would use more um, red meats. So use like beef, grass-fed beef, because then you get, you not only get the, the, the blood of the beef, so you get that hemoglobin from the red meat, but you'll also get the really great omega-3s from the grass-fed beef. So I would add um, 
more things that are going to tonify blood. So if you go and you look at our website, you can look at different foods that are going to tonify blood. And those would be the sort of foods that I'd be using with her. And I would say that that's kind of getting to the root of it. So you're doing um, thyroid replacement therapy now? We just started. Um, and I would rather get away from that if I can. Um, yeah, and I would say that that's fine. But the beauty of it is if it, it, it takes a while to tonify blood, this is not like a quick turnaround. It's, it takes you know three to four months for blood to turn okay. around. So three to four months of using blood tonifying herbs and using blood tonifying foods and, and still go ahead, use the, um, the thyroid replacement if you need to, if you want to. Um, but then the beauty is keep on testing. And what you'll see is as her underlying blood deficiency goes away, because of all the things that you're doing, the thyroid will naturally start to produce as it should again. In a blood test, what would indicate the blood issues? What parts it, of it? There isn't. Um, it, it, it's kind of like when I talked about yin, that um, Western medicine doesn't really acknowledge that it, you're either dehydrated or not. And okay. it, that's as far as it takes it. The same thing with blood. You're either anemic or you're not. And it doesn't take it any farther than that. Okay. Where Chinese medicine looks at blood deficiency so much more deeply. It looks at blood deficiency as not just anemia. It could be anemia, but it also could be more than that. And it could be the dryness to the coat. It could be the roughness to the coat. It could be dry, itchy. It could be um, this thyroid going down. And and so it's not one of those things that you can necessarily do a blood test on. So if you tested her, um, her PCV would probably be normal. So the indication of packed cell volume of um, hemoglobin and red blood cells might be normal. But she'd still, from a Chinese her, perspective, have this blood deficiency. And I would, take it back, I would take it back to the root of it is probably from the the mom who's had too many puppies and was never really brought back to a place where she should have more puppies. You know, I asked about the blood test because her platelet count is actually low, mm -hmm. but they, but they do say it's, even though it's low, it's adequate because it's still clumping. They, so. And that would just, be the Western way of thinking about it. Yeah, Cause she had a scan done by Hemopet. Okay. With her thyroid and everything. So. Fabulous. You know, and thyroid is also, it, sometimes it's primary and sometimes it's secondary. And um, from a Chinese perspective, we tend to think it's more secondary than primary, meaning, meaning that if, if you had that balance of yin and yang and you had an even movement and blood was at the level it should be, then the thyroid would function normally. So it's called euthyroid from a Western perspective. Okay. Well, I'll look into the tonifying the blood and, and hopefully that will help and hopefully I can get her off the thyroid medication. The herbs you would want to use are Romania, like, like we were going to use in the other dog that tonifies yin. Um, and it's a formula called Si Wu Tong and it's spelled S-I space W-U space T-A-N-G. Got okay. it. I just put it in the chat. There, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. And and where where do I find those kinds of things? Um, boy, you could go online, and there's a lot of um, a lot of really good um, herbal companies that you could buy it online directly, okay. or you could buy it from any um, veterinary herbalist or any holistic veterinarian. Yeah, I don't have any of those where I live. <laughs> yeah, then you could probably get it online. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very helpful. You're welcome, Thank you. All right. So I think we've got time for one more to squeeze in. Yep. Um, Jim, Jim joins us almost every week and he's got, he's got no mic. So I'm going to ask for him. They're Tibetan Terrier, 11 years old, has a mast cell tumor at the base of his tail. Would you recommend modified X U E F U Z H U Zu Fu Zu? Sorry, I don't know how to say this. And yeah. then Yu Tang? Yep. 
We are giving him the Jing Tang Concentrated Stasis Breaker and Y Chi Booster, Four Life Transfer Factor, CBD oil, and real mushrooms. He has had this for about two years. It got larger and now has broken open, releasing fluid and is smaller in size. Would this be a sign that the body is healing itself? We are working with a doctor named Charles Loops, a homeopath. Any other supplement questions would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Jim and Carol Duff. Yeah, that, sorry, Jim, that is just a, that's a tough one. Um, I love the, it's called Shufu Juyu San, and it's a, it's a really strong combination of herb that is, um, breaks up stagnation. So it, it's fabulous. Um, I think you're on the right herbs. I think you're, it sounds like you're doing all the right stuff. Boy, without um, doing a tongue and pulse evaluation, it'd be hard for me to give you any more information. Um, but what I would suggest is going to a holistic veterinarian. I don't know if you have, if you must be because you're getting gin tang um, herbs, so you must be. Um, and, and I would recommend doing acupuncture as well um, because I would, I would put mast cell tumors in kind of that same category of um, things are going awry because there's some disharmony going on um, and you need herbs and acupuncture to correct that. And tongue and pulse evaluation would be the thing that would help you to determine that. Awesome. Um, before we finish up this evening, I have a question and I'm sure a whole lot of the attendees are curious too. Dr. Besant, do you take phone consults or are you taking patients right now? Um, I don't. Um, right now I um, primarily teach other veterinarians yeah. and, and do talks like this and, and manage the two businesses. Um, but what we are doing is um, developing, and I think Sarah's gonna be rolling it out in the next um, month or so, a, um, an evaluation form so that you could write in and tell me all the details and then I can help to direct you. And it might be just help to direct you in the right way, meaning you need a holistic veterinarian to help with you help with this, or mm -hmm. I could recommend supplements or herbs or food. And so we are developing that right now, um, but you can always email me as well. So you, could, um, you can find me on Facebook or you can email either Simple Food Project or email Herbsmith. And what'll happen is they'll, they'll send that to me and I'll evaluate and make recommendations. And I might also, um, ask more questions so that I get a better view of what they're like energetically. And then if it's something I can help you with directly, I will. If not, then it might be referring you to somebody in your area. Awesome. And that's, that's an invaluable resource that you're willing to share. Thank you. Um, also, if, if you need to be connected to a holistic veterinarian, you can email us and, and we've got a list of vetted people that are practicing that, that we can pass on to everyone too. And our yeah, and there's also, there's organizations that you can go to and you just put your um, zip code in if you're in the U S and um, it'll give you a list of veterinarians that have specialized advanced training in different modalities. So it might be homeopathy, it might be herbs, it might be acupuncture and then, or chiropractic. And then you can find somebody that'll be in your area. But um, it, Julie's absolutely right. There's just not enough holistic vets out there. And I think that's kind of the root behind, for, certainly for me, it was the root behind developing um, Herbsmith products and um, the Simple Food Project. And I'm sure it's the same for the Adored Beast, is that if there was enough holistic vets out there for everybody, then that would be great. But there unfortunately just aren't enough yet. Mm -hmm. Something really hit home with me earlier that you said, and uh, Julie and yourself, your philosophy is very similar when you say that we don't make products. Yeah. We are making solutions for these animals. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think I wanted everyone to know that too, because it's, it's, there's not a lot of companies that, um, 
have used the their products and seen empirically how it's done on their own patients, right? It's it's a I try to you know I think I think everybody puts their hearts and souls into their products, but there's something to be said about looking at something and going, okay, I've used this on a hundred different exactly. cases, or I've used this on a hundred different cushing cases, or whatever, and I and I know I can I can sit here and know how it works. Yeah. It's your, com your company is like that too. And it's just, it's, um, it, they're far and few. I mean, when we, when I first started and now, I mean, everybody and their brother has supplement companies, you know, and it's, and I'm, like I said, I'm sure everybody's heart's in the right place to help animals. But when you guys are looking for products and you're, and you're on the internet, you get sort of bombarded with stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah. when you can find companies where, where the products have been um, used in clinical practice, even more than researched, you know, like, yep. it, like research products are great, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very confined and, and regulated and whatever for the research. And when you're using your own, your own products within your practice, you have this diverse amount of animals in their situations and when you see that work, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, it's just, it's, it, it's really like comparing apples to oranges, right? Yeah. So, and I would say just like, like you, um, all my conversation on herbs and acupuncture are based on clinical practice, but they're also based on lots and lots of research out there. So anybody who says there's not research on herbs is just ignorant oh. because there are hundreds of thousands of solid yeah. scientific research studies uh -huh. behind each and every herb and and where they're used and what they're best used for and there's thousands of years of practitioners using it so and the beauty is they're so safe i mean they're not all safe there are some that are that definitely need veterinary guidance that yeah. have a uh, that are more towards the toxic side but especially the over the counter herbs are so yeah. safe and so helpful and it's just this foundation of health yeah it's true it's true you two well, are incredible <laughs> amen <Yeah>. sister <laughs> well, that's my only joke <laughs> <laughs> well thank you guys so much for having me it was a joy oh, to thank you discuss so this. much it was wonderful to talk with people with like-minded philosophy yeah and steph if you want to put their um the the website on one more time just before make sure everybody that's the bottom would be absolutely great. yeah i would love to uh it's herbsmithinc.com and the other one is the simple food project let me see if i can pull it up quick um and hey if anyone doesn't doesn't see the link or doesn't paste it in time always shoot us an email and and we can connect you with the resources that you need to get what you need done thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight it was an incredible evening we'll see you again next week have a good night thanks very much everybody have a good night bye julie bye, bye. thank you so much <laughs>